were seen from the first nylon mains and jibs. Then for a couple of years, vignon and then acrylic orlon were tried before polyester Dacron sales started showing up in the early 1950s and took hold as the decade proceeded. Stu Hotchkiss joined off soundings in 1953, but a lot of his sailing was done as crew for Rod Stevens, the brother of boat designer Olin. Well, I'm not exactly sure how many years it is, but uh, it goes back before World War II, and uh, then uh, in 1946, when Rod Stevens bought Mustang, uh, I sailed regularly with him, and uh, I've been sailing quite regularly ever since 1946. A sailor really doesn't get very far without a crew. They become an essential element of sailing. They handle just about every chore known. In recent years, the number of crew members has grown. The move toward fiberglass boats in the 60s was gradual. The early boats shown in the films were in Class B, the smaller craft. It wasn't until the later 60s that larger boats began appearing in glass. In 1961, the Coast Guard would no longer offer a cutter as a committee boat. So Henry B. DuPont, who had already been actively sailing his 48-foot Pacific Coast class Cyan and a newer Sparkman and Stevens designed Cyan, offered Nor'easter as a committee boat. Nor'easter is a 58-foot William Hand motor sailor built in 1924. From 1961 and for 15 years, Nor'easter was the committee boat of record. It became a signature of off soundings. As the 1960s continued, some pretty vintage boats remained in the fleet. The Fisher's Island 23, the R boats, S boats, the Buzzards Bay 25, still a gaff rig or two. Even a few of the unusual joined the fleet. Boats that may take half a gale to make them go. This boat, Brandaris, is a Dutch shallow draft leeboard cutter rig. The boat appears in pictures for numerous races up to 1969. Other interesting boats show up. In the early 1960s, the boats stopped going to Shelter Island and its beautiful Deering Harbor. The second night of racing was replaced with a stay at Three Mile Harbor. After our soundings made the move from Shelter Island, as, as talked about before, we discovered a nice place to, to have our rendezvous in Three Mile Harbor in a spot called the Maidstone Marina, which was sort of a little puddle carved out of the mainland. Um, run by a very colorful lady known as the Dragon Lady. I think her real name was Mrs. Palmer. In any event, it was quite satisfactory. Most boats anchored out in the middle of Three Mile Harbor and launched in, but those that went into her marina, it was ideal in there, with one exception. When the tide was low, you couldn't get in or out, and that was kind of a drawback. But we enjoyed the Three Mile Harbor, and we stayed there until Shelter Island said uncle and wanted us back. The shore party in the 1960s featured dozens of sailors, but off soundings like almost every other sailing organization continued as a male attraction. The role of women was passive. When we first started racing in off soundings, there just weren't that many women there. Most of us were wives of, of boat owners or at least our husbands made me th made us think that maybe we were sharing a partnership in this boat ownership. But there just weren't that many women out there sailing. Basically, was a male stronghold. 
There were a few of us who raced aboard regularly, but a lot of the women came over on the ferry just for the party, and they missed out. What happened was just a good time, and we looked forward to spring and fall just because we all got together, and we saw people from various areas up and down the sound that we never saw regularly. 1970 revived an old destination for the races. Location of the off soundings rendezvous, i.e. end of the races, uh, we were always interested in finding new courses for the fleet. Uh, sometimes those new locations were not of our own volition. The pollution issue became a problem and New York State took a very aggressive approach to pollution, saying that no one could be in their waters unless they had holding tanks or treatment devices. Back then, this was just in its infancy, and we had a decision to make with our soundings whether we would violate those uh, rules of no discharge or treatment and naturally we had to uh, get out of New York State because we didn't want to put anyone in the fleet in jeopardy. The docking headquarters for the Friday jump off for the races became Noank and Stonington because of their closeness to the starting line off Watch Hill. It was also about this time that the off soundings board of governors permitted the introduction of the cruising canvas class. This class was intended for owners that simply didn't want the hassle of flying a spinnaker. From that point forward, the cruising canvas class has grown in size and was bound to the same course as the smaller boats. The fall start in 1970 was plagued with fog, which became a consideration in many of the races to and around Block Island. The error on that first race was unimpressive but the greeting at Block Island was encouraging. After a good night in the Great Salt Pond at Block Island, the sailors were ready for a better day. The Saturday racing of the series was much more promising. The early racing to Block Island offered about the same course as today. All the boats sailed from the start, just east of Watch Hill, around the red and white whistle buoy off Watch Hill. Then the smaller boats and cruising canvas boats continued to 1BI off the northern tip of the island. They would round that buoy and go on to the finish line off the Great Salt Pond. The larger boats going around the MOA whistle would proceed to Nebraska Shoal, round that Red Nun, and go on to the finish line. The boats in the 1960s and 70s began to take on a new look under the water line as well as above. Lighter displacement was the most obvious, but under that water line, the boats were beginning to get flatter bottoms or harder chines, highlighted by short, deep, thin keels and separate rudders. This was a big change from the full, long keel boats of before. Our soundings always classified their vessels because almost all of them the same underbody together. At one point, we decided that since the rule won't work properly, no matter what, for these fin keel spade rudder things, we started classifying them into separate classes. And there was quite a significant event. We now started with one C class. We're now up to five C classes. We used to have five A and B classes. We're now down to two. Sign of the times. A local designer, Bob Evelyn, exhibited his new boat, Pointing Star, in 1975 at the spring off soundings. The boat was light and fast, but in the fresh breeze suffered rudder damage, but despite that, finished first. It was only in the early 1970s that sail numbers became more consistent and useful for spotting. Before that, many boats had no numbers at all on the sail, and that made identification for the race committee difficult. Therefore, the racing instructions required that every boat would carry a large card with a number assigned to each boat for that race. While going over the finish line, the card would be displayed in the boat's standings recorded by the race committee. In 1976, the late Peter Sanger's new fiberglass schooner is sighted, 
and exhibits just some of the variety always in the fleet. That same year, West Maxwell's 60-year-old S-boat Phryne was sailed successfully. It seems the New York State regulations regarding overboard discharge from boats was a federal matter, and like Rhode Island, New York now decided not to enforce it. So in 1977, Off Soundings decided to return to Long Island for one race series a year. New London was happy about the decision. That return was also greeted on Long Island with enthusiasm. 1977 meant another change. The death of Henry DuPont Jr. in 1970 and then his son's death in 1977 meant the loss of Nor'easter as a race committee boat. Greater expense for the club was incurred with the charter of Empress. Empress was promoted as a portable committee boat for hire. It had been used for the America's Cup Challenge and Defender Trials, as well as many other races along the East Coast. Aboard Empress, meals were provided, as well as several staterooms. Therefore, some overnight accommodations ashore and meal expenses for the race committee could be reduced. When off soundings returned to Long Island, the course remained pretty consistent over the next years. The boats would all leave from the starting line at Sarah Ledge off New London. The larger, faster boats would stay close to Fisher's Island. Then they sailed to and rounded Cerber Shoal and entered Gardner's Bay, observing one GI at the ruins and on to the finish line at an MOA buoy off Greenport. The other classes went west, passing Valiant Rock and entering Gardner's Bay sailed on to the finish line. In recent years, however, the courses have been altered, so all classes pass Valiant Rock and once in Gardner's Bay sail various courses, depending on the class, using the traditional finish line. The late 70s showed a new material, mylar, being used for main and jib. The shore party continued as an opportunity for all sailors to get together and discuss the day's race, have a drink, or just act a little foolish. Credit for shooting the film up to 1983 goes to Mel Southworth, Dr. Meyer, Agnew Fisher, Alfred F. Loomis, Norman Fortier, Peter Converse, Monk Gordon, Roger Epley, and a few others. Up to this time, the camera had caught many scenes, including these varied subjects. Here in 1955, the light air causes a close confrontation between two boats. A schooner storms across the finish line in 1957. A torn main. A broken mast in 1973. Another lost mast that same year. Here is a boat grounded on the flats off Shelter Island Yacht Club in Deering Harbor. In 1975, Betty Betty tears the jib. 1976, a tight collision at the starting line. Whoops, this boat didn't estimate the tide right when rounding Nebraska Shoal. A little gouge is easily fixed. In 1983, Nor'easter, now owned by John Helm, returned to Off Soundings as a stake boat, patrol and camera boat, and carrying the on-call doctor for Off Soundings. In that same year, all the earlier Off Soundings films were donated by the club to Mystic Seaport. Since 1983, the museum's camera operator, Ken Mahler, has shot most of the races. As historian, Bill Ames has helped Mystic Seaport in the presentation of the Off Soundings program at the club's awards banquet. Bill describes for viewers the names and events that surround the yearly series. In fall 1984, the first day of racing from Watch Hill was lumpy and wet.
Joe's usual problems with spinnakers were enhanced by the fresh breeze and miserable cold weather. Even the usual perfect sailor, Ed Raymond, aboard Shantyman, had trouble with his spinnaker that day. The Saturday race was canceled when the wind piped up. Boats tried to leave, but many returned after seeing what was in store for them outside the Great Salt Pond at Block Island. In 1986, with donations from Off Soundings members and memorials, Mystic Seaport made the switch from 16 millimeter film to three quarter inch broadcast videotape. Now the edited programs could include sound as recorded on the race course, music, and Bill Ames' narration. In the early 80s, the fleet was experiencing the J24 class boats. This light displacement, fast moving, user friendly boat in future years was to be joined by many others of its class. The video shows a long-standing Class B favorite, Ed Purcell's Just Friends. A boat like this is the shortest length allowed to race in off-soundings. That limit has an interesting story. Okay. The off-soundings rule and the off-soundings rules allowed any vessel to race in our races that had the accommodations you could sleep in, you could eat in it, you could go to the head in it, etc. But we determined pretty early on that the measurement rule didn't work if vessels were too small. They were unfairly uh, ad advantaged. So we picked the lower limit of 23 and 3 quarters feet. That happened because Rod Stevens was coming out with the dolphin 24-foot dolphin at this point, and brought up the point, the fact that we couldn't stick with 25, so we elected 23 and 3 quarters feet. The upper size, 62 feet, is still the case, and that happened to a similar event that Pierre DuPont's Barlavento was 62 feet long. Things were that simple. The Coast Guard Academy boats have participated in off-sounding since the early years. Here, CGA-5 is seen under some pretty fine sailing conditions. When the off-soundings pictures switched from film to video, a small 8mm video camcorder was purchased for use on the committee boat. It was intended to bring a different view for shots there. This camcorder also captured the first boats getting the gun at the finish line. The broadcast camera was usually located at the stake boat end of the starting line and missed occurrences happening near the committee boat. Here is a perfect example of that camera in use. Bill Ames shoots the start of Class A1 in spring 1987, the 50th anniversary for off soundings. Although a little jumpy, the video shows some pretty enthusiastic barging at the start. The fall series in 1987 was windy and rainy. After being unable to get a race line set off Watch Hill, Larry Jacobson, new to being race committee chair, called off the race. After the cancellation, the race committee boat Empress, the camera boat, and some of the hardy fleet headed for Block Island, hoping to have racing there the next day. Upon arriving at the island, the conditions did not improve as the boats staggered in. By Saturday, conditions had worsened. The lost race day became a day for the crews and owners to visit on the island, fiddle about the boat, or hang out at Champlain's Marina, and watch a little TV, and dream of racing another day. In 1988, Off Soundings returned to Watch Hill. The Board of Governors decided to reverse the racing venues. The course to Block Island would be in the spring now, and in the fall, the boats would rendezvous at Deering Harbor at Shelter Island. 
Also this year, Mystic Seaport added a gyro-stabilized lens to its equipment list. This lens was to present a new dimension to pictures shot on the water. In the past, the boat on which the camera operator was taking pictures had to get in close to get a full shot. Now the camera boat could stay away from the starting line or the boat being photographed and use the telephoto gyro stabilized lens to bring these shots in close and stable. No matter what the design, displacement, or sail material, the fact remains the captain and crew make the difference in getting off the starting line first and making it to the finish to get the gun. The crew on the boat make up a team to get things done right, fast, and safely. When it's all over for the day, the crew likely parties the most and sleeps the soundest. But for them, the entire experience should be a lot of fun For the owners, the same could hopefully be said. There's no question that Off Soundings provides an ideal training ground for crew and crew development. I remember when I came back uh, um, after years in the service and uh, at graduate school and got sailing again in Off Soundings with Elliot Porter, the stories that he would tell of the number of skippers that he sailed under and what it meant to him in terms of training as a, as a uh, as good crew and eventually skipper. Um, we try, I think, all of us to carry on that tradition, bringing in new and younger uh, members as crew in hopes of them coming along, getting up to the skipper and race eventually. As the 1980s continued, newer designs were added to the fleet. Several classes were beginning to take on the look of boats typical in Grand Prix regattas elsewhere. There's greater intensity in the racing now than in the early days. I think that we can all come up with different answers as to why that might happen. However, I, my instinct is that the world we live in runs at a much more intense competitive pace than in earlier days, and consequently, that sort of behavioral pattern is apparent in our yacht racing. On Saturday in the fall series, 1989, the wind blew as high as 45 knots in usually sheltered Gardner's Bay, and it was as choppy as any sailor had seen it in some time. Photographing from the stable camera platform aboard Freedom, Mystic Seaport photographer Maria Smith caught the best shots of off-soundings boats in heavy air using the gyro-stabilized camera. The race went on, and the scenes give testimony to the hair-raising race it was.
The beginning of the last decade of the 20th century started with light air and quiet seas off Watch Hill. Frank Boland's Tatler almost got hit when another boat, not realizing the set of the tide, slipped down very close to Tatler's topsides. This race was like too many for sailors. It was light air. Rounding the Nun at Nebraska Shoal, which is positioned just a few miles west of Point Judith, Rhode Island, and standing just two and a half miles off the smooth Rhode Island shoreline, was a frustration and maybe embarrassment for some boats turning the mark and heading for Block Island in the finish. The urge to do well is strong on any off-soundings boat. For that reason, it wasn't surprising that over the years, the camera has caught very few youngsters as primary crew aboard the boats. This scene in spring 1990 aboard Jack Rose is an exception. Also in this scene, the owner's wife plays an active role in helping the young crew member. Another advantage for new boats was their ability to pivot quickly on their short, deep keels. Here, tidy paws makes a perfect tack in good air. The fall race of 1990 brings a perfect example of the ability of the newly designed boats being capable of turning fast. Here, the spinnaker on Wes Maxwell's Bob Evelyn designed Fifi is fouled. Responding instantly, Wes plunges the boat into a 360 degree turn and clears the spinnaker. In this same race, a shot is caught by the camera which suggests that this crew member came close to slipping over the side. Just a few minutes later, the camera catches this shot of jarred loose, nearly on its side while overpowered with the spinnaker. In 1991, Mystic Seaport's 61-foot schooner Brilliant, designed by Olin Stevens and built by Henry B. Nevins in 1931, was invited by the off-soundings board to take part in the races. Brilliant was at the extreme of length allowed into off-soundings races. Brilliant added to the fleet a companion for the older wooden boats still sailing and performing well. Dolphin had remained in the fleet as a constant competitor from the earliest days. Another wooden boat in the racing is Spindrift, planning to sail into the 21st century with off-soundings. Spindrift was sailing with its owner in the 1941 off-soundings. The boat was built in Bristol, Rhode Island by the Harrisoft Manufacturing Company in 1927 and was part of a class known as the Fisher's Island 31. The Concordia is a class of wooden boat that has graced off-soundings from the early 1950s. This beautiful yawl was carefully laid out by Waldo Howland, the former owner of the Concordia Company of South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Most of the Concordias were built in Germany. Constructed of fiberglass, sail number 655 became a classic on the off-sounding circuit. Wimbrel was owned by past Commodore Jack English. The 47-foot boat was first spotted in the 1981 race series and sailed into the late 1990s. In 1990, the race committee boat Empress was no longer available for hire when Bill Thomas, the owner, retired. Nor'easter had been sold by John Helm to a new owner. The race committee was fortunate in using Freedom as race committee boat from 1990 to 93. Freedom, a large and comfortable power yacht, was owned by a past off-sounding sailboater, Harry Elliott. In the spring of 1993, a new design shows up on the line. This Rodney Johnstone creation sports a bowsprit that can extend and retract. The unusual jib gives the boat a lot of sail area. It moves very fast on certain points of sail. That same year, past Commodore Bill Gunther's Froya, a McCurdy Rhodes 47 sloop, is first spotted and presents a tall mast on the horizon of off-soundings boats. Many other owners were sailing and enjoying the racing venue with their boats boats that keep the spirit of off-soundings alive. In 1992, the club broke precedent 
and elected Eileen Ames, its first female honorary member. For her work serving on the race committee, the mountainous clerical work she had overseen, and her years with the organization of the annual awards banquet. Also that year, the board asked two other wooden boat classics to join the racing. Neath, owned by Jack Brown of Texas, was invited to bring his 1905 Harris off. This fabulous sloop, of which only one was built, was fully restored and became the oldest boat sailing in the races. The other boat invited was Cephedra, an Augie Nielsen designed, Paul Luke built 51 foot yawl. For many off soundings members, the introduction into the racing of Cephedra brought back memories of a sister ship, Seaflower, sailed in the 50s and 60s by member Steve Castle. In 1993, off soundings again broke with tradition and he elected Cephedra's owner, Queenie Hooper Foster, the first boat-owning, dues-paying female member. Since that time, several other female members have been elected to membership. In 1993, Nor'easter, the superb motor sailor, originally owned by Henry B. DuPont, Jr., was now owned by his grandson, Henry. Nor'easter returned to Off Soundings as race committee boat. The boat had been completely rebuilt and brought to the race as a great tradition and a beautifully restored icon. In the fall of that year, race committee chair Wes Maxwell convinced the committee to try something new. The boats would sail Peconic Bay instead of Gardner's Bay for the Saturday race. Always known for its fresh breeze and quiet waters, the race this year was plagued by fast-moving tides around one particular mark. Later in the day, the race suffered from a lack of wind. This was the last year the new course was attempted and the boats returned next fall to the traditional waters of Gardner's Bay. In that next fall, the race committee altered the courses and routine. High performance classes were instructed to participate in two shorter races, while other classes would run a slightly modified race course. In spring 1995, another newly restored traditional wooden boat re-entered off soundings racing. The boat had raced many years earlier. Rogue is a variation of the Newport 29, the same class as the traditional off soundings competitor Dolphin. In the fall of 1995, the race committee invited 12 meters to join the racing in Gardner's Bay. The Twelves were to be joined by others from Newport, but only Fiddler and Fury showed. A couple of short races were conducted, and then the boat started and overtook the off-soundings fleet on the normal course. The 12-meter class are about 68 feet in length, the 92-foot masts tower above the regular class racers. The crossing of Long Island Sound by Valiant Rock Buoy is usually safe, but always a passage advising caution. In the fall 1996 series, the crossing was way out of the ordinary, with the tide running fast. The boats thought they could run to the mark from the starting line off New London. But as they neared the buoy, the current was stronger and the chop was great. For a few moments and a few boats, it was a scary time. Spring 1997. Only the home video camcorder was there that series. The course to Block Island was rainy, but the wind was good. On Friday, the fleet proceeded directly to Block Island. Their special marks were set in the lee of the island where the sea was not so choppy. The next day was nice and the racing around Block Island was good. The fall 1997 race was uneventful. Beautiful weather conditions, but no air on Friday and okay air on Saturday made for a quiet end to the season. It's beautiful out in the water, you forget all your stresses in life. And that's why I love it so much. Whoa, I'll drink to that. I'll drink, I'll drink to anything. Today was nice, yesterday was bad. Thank you. In getting away for a day or two, even though we don't go all that far, we get away from home and the trials and tribulations of business and the everyday life and uh, focus entirely 
on two days of racing. So that even though a, it's only a couple of days, it's a real break in uh, the regimen tedium of life. And that also has been a very special aspect. Uh, to be able to get that break in the spring and the break in the fall has meant a lot to us. In spring 1998, the gyro camera from Mystic Seaport was not on the race course again. Bad weather was expected and engine trouble sent the camera boat back to Noank. Bill Ames with the camcorder, however, was there. On Saturday, a race was held in the lee of Block Island. The rain poured and the wind blew and the boats moved. The owner of Phoenix was interviewed at the fall race and had a philosophical outlook on the windy spring off Block Island. The spring series was good. That was fun. Oh, you like that? Yeah, it was really blowing. I wasn't think, there. Wait a minute. If you think about it, in San Francisco, I mean, people sail in heavy air all the time. I like sailing in the rain. Heavy air is fun and rain and a big wind. Oh, yeah. Although you have to rest, especially when you're our age, as you can so see. So we're resting. We're resting. Well, off soundings as a whole, I think, in my, in my point of view anyway, it's been so successful and so much fun. And number one, it is so professionally run by amateurs. The, the, the handicapping is fast, accurate. Everybody's proud of it and it was fun. The full 1998 Friday race was an example of great racing. The sky was gray, but the air was fresh as the boats ran with spinnakers in Gardner's Bay. An old name, but a new boat for owner Ed Purcell. Just Friends runs up Gardner's Bay wing and wing, catching the air just right. The Saturday race at Gardner's Bay started with light air and close starts. Later in the day, the wind increased a little and made for some good sailing. The top of the party that fall night at the Shelter Island Yacht Club was the pile-up at a special mark to the north near the ferry dock at Orient Point. At that mark, the wind went very light. This is the story you hear when it works. When it didn't work, it was all bad luck. <laughs> and, and, and I thought it was going to be the worst thing in the world. And suddenly, we went around and we were clear. And we just sailed away. In all the roundings, at all the marks, in all the off-soundings history, this one caught on videotape was one of the tightest. Many sailors later said, we ignored little collisions and just shook hands with our neighbor and prayed we'd get through and nobody would protest. The last races for off soundings in the 1900s took place on June 11th and 12th. The 8mm camcorder was there on the committee boat to record some images. Where to go, Bert? The fall race in 1999 was cancelled. The threat of Hurricane Floyd was too great. You have to remember that Off Soundings for years has been an innovator in many aspects of small boat racing. Our rule was the rule of choice in um, most uh, inshore handicap racing until PHRF came along. In terms of safety, uh, we introduced a number of uh, uh, requirements, including self bailing cockpits and the like. The format of the race itself was something of an innovation when it came along. So we're used to innovation, but we also uh, appreciate tradition. We will be trying to adhere as much as possible to that in the future. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be looking at change. What kind of change is a little bit hard to nail down at the moment, but we are, for example, continually reviewing venue, just where we're racing and when we're racing. Uh, we're going to be interested.